time for Cutting Edge Consciousness with Freeman Michaels and Barnett Bain. Thought-provoking discussions and bold ideas from the edge of possibility. And welcome to Cutting Edge Consciousness. Freeman Michaels here. With Barnett Bain. Good Did you moment. like my excitement and enthusiasm? I thought you were exuberant, and I appreciate that. So we need to tell our listeners that we're... Uh, we only have one pen between us? <laughs> no, the sponsor... Uh, 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 I'm yes, we so do. We do my, need. Uh, we do want to remind game. our listeners. Thank you. Uh, that um, <laughs> this program is made possible for all of you folks mm. by the good graces of Insight Events USA and Hierophant Publishing, um, publishers of wonderful books in the body, mind, uh, spirit area, and um, they support us, and we hope that you will support them. Yeah. Good. Well done. So uh, you were. You yes, don't you read were, off a script anymore. You've got that uh, committed to memory. You know, I have it's noticed. Fantastic. I have noticed that uh, over the last uh, six decades, my ability to um, memorize things is. I wanted to. I wanted to take a, a, an acting class. Yeah. Um, but I'm hesitant because, on the oh, one the hand, I do want to um, renew some chops. But on the other hand, they always m- insist that you memorize memorize stuff, stuff and I can't uh, I can't remember stuff. I, there was this actor. Um, he was actually a professor, Marlon Brando. <laughs> no, uh, who would come and do plays in the theater department when I was in college. A guy named yeah. Ted Gross. Yeah. Um, and he would always forget his lines. You know what was good about that, though, is it kept everyone on edge, which is is good for an actor. It is. Be, it is. Be, it's not so good. It's like, but it's not so good. It's good way for your scene partner, but it's not so good when you <laughs> days out. It's like it's not so good when you're on the radio. And suddenly there are those uh, grand canyons of silence. One of the best uh, acting experiences. You need an evil Knievel. You one of the best somebody. acting experiences I had. We were doing Summerstock, and they decided we were doing um, Annie Get Your Gun, uh, Kiss Me Kate, a show called Go Tell Mama, Blythe Spirit, and uh, and Charlie's Aunt. I played yeah. Charlie. Um, and Blythe Spirit got stuck in there and had to go up in like four days. It was insane. Nobody knew their lines. <laughs> no. no. But they had this great improv actor, a guy named, uh, uh, hold on a sec. I can't remember that if guy. If you name. remember this, then I'm going home. Uh, God, he was good though. But it was one of the, I was running sound for that because you always did something for every play because we were, you know, it was, it was summer stock. I cut oranges. I, I, so I was up running sound. I ate the oranges. Stop. I cut them and then I'd eat the Burn oranges. Burn it, I can't get a story out. <laughs> but it was such a good show just because like we would sit there and marvel at this guy. Um, God, I can see his face. He was so good. He did comedy sports, which is like an improv thing. Yeah. So he was the perfect actor to stick up there, and like everyone, and he covered lost. everyone. He just spackled. He, he spackled over everybody's uh, dented lines. Great stuff. Great stuff. So off book, off script, Barnett, go for it. Not so Take easy. Take an acting class. Not so easy to go off uh, book when you can't remember anything. That's your edge. Well, it's one of them. Yeah. So you know we've committed on the show and in our lives to live at the edge. That's a smooth segue, if I've ever heard one. That's the cutting edge spirit that and, we like. And to. speaking of edge dwellers, yeah, we have a wonderful guest today. Yes, edgy. So, wh- he's so edgy, it's, it's awesome. An edgy, an edgy awesome guy. Awesome edgy guy. Did you know he's a formal, uh, former criminal lawyer? I did. And uh, it's, uh, my notes say he's either a, a former psychotherapist or a psychopath, but... Uh, <laughs> it depends which day of the week. <laughs> but he's integrated both sides. If you can integrate the former lawyer, then uh, you are really um, uh, you are really a superseding self. That do, really is a higher self. Do you want to talk about the books he's written or the movies he's made? He has made quite a few. Listen, he wrote one of my favorite books, Soul Shaping, and I have in my hands uh, his new novel, An Uncommon Bond. So all of you driving up the 101, lean toward the dash. <laughs> That's right. And feel into it. Feel into it. Um, he wrote Ascending with Both Feet on the Ground, which I love. That sits actually in my restroom for uh, inspiration and moments. <laughs> and he wrote, uh, he directed Carmageddon, which is one of my favorite films. Uh, a crazy, crazy documentary uh, about a nutty hole situation. Hey, welcome, uh, Jeff, to the, to the show. Happy to be here, guys. We heard it snowed up there. Yeah, it snowed the last couple of days. What's going on? Are you guys ever going to get spring? This is normal spring? now. We get like, you go straight from winter to summer. So it's not May. a karmic thing? 
I, I don't know. It's a. Co- it might be a cosmic thing. I'm it's not, a cosmic. I'm thing. so busy trying to figure out what it is to be a psychotherapist that I don't even think about the weather. <laughs> psycho. It's uh. It's like um. With bicy- emphasis it's like on bicy- psycho. It's a bicycling person. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so look, what I love about your work, uh, Jeff Brown, my friend, is that you are radically honest. That is your striving, is to go deeper, farther, wider, faster. You're like the bionic spiritual author guy. You're the Star Trek of uh, authors. That's it. <laughs> How's it feel to have that, uh, that laid on That you? mantle. Well, you know, if you know, I, I I don't know about the the characterizations, but I but it makes it it feels right to me. I I know we're going to talk a little bit about the childhood parts and self concept, and I I remember, you know, one of the ways that I dealt with my social anxiety was I spent a lot of time inside of myself, trying to clarify and distinguish the real self from the false self, and so it became this quest for something authentic was so conditioned into me from an early time that just writing from that whatever my truth is in the moment feels um, mostly feels comfortable. I mean, at first there was anxiety about it, social anxiety about how I would be received when Soul Shaping first came out, but now it feels uh, it feels wonderful to speak from that place. But there, you know, as you're speaking, um, you referred for a moment to those uh, that early self. Yeah. Uh, th- th- there's an early self that longed for some structure some fixed ideas about life, uh, which surely is the one of the qualities that led you into the law. I think the law calling was... Uh, I used to see Eddie Greenspan, who's a, a criminal yeah. lawyer who just passed away in Canada on television as an adolescent, and I used to say, I know that man, I'm going to work with him, and one day I have to be a trial lawyer. So it felt like a soul path for me. But at the same time, I mean, this is why it's so interesting, these these questions as to where these tendencies come from, it was clearly psychologically driven. I was living out the vicarious experience of defending a client, the idea of defending a client, because my childhood was all about defending myself before my difficult mother and father. Exactly. And so it had this psychological component, and yet at the same time, it felt like an absolute sacred purpose-driven path. The, the grooves that we find ourselves in, this language captured your imagination, right? There's something about it that grabbed your sense of what was possible for you. And, and out of that, you began to create possibilities for yourself. Um, the part for me is the people who have given me permission. You're one of them, by the way, because honestly, in, in reading your writing, it's uh, given me permission. And then the beauty of our friendship is you... Um, you've said, keep going, you know, you've encouraged me. And throughout my life, there have been these people who've come along who give me permission. You know, Barnett, you know my training partner, Susan, and the thing about working with her, uh, kind of like a good acting scene partner, Mm -hmm. is she pushes me to my edge. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. she's a little unpredictable in a good way, Mm -hmm. you know, and and she goes for it. Mm -hmm. And, And that then gives me more permission. And again, tracking back, even early childhood, there were various people that came along who saw the glint in my eye. You know, for most- People who wait at the edge of your possibility. Yeah, because I think most of my family, honestly, were overwhelmed by it. You know, I talked too much. I was too emotional. It wasn't, it mm-hmm. wasn't within their frame of reference, and they kept mm-hmm. trying to crunch me down to be more acceptable for the world they lived in, and I kept having to find these outlets, acting, of course, being one of them. I had to have this thing where I could do something and be more myself than I could in the day-to-day. Well, if we fit comfortably... Like a, uh, a a little a jigsaw piece in the middle of a puzzle that has already been worked out. If you find your place and you just nestle in there so comfortably, there is a, it's a, certainly a legitimate life. It's more of a, a an R and R life. Mm. Uh, merrily we roll along. Yeah. Then there are the more active lives where there are agendas of uh, love and of growth. Uh, we rarely fit comfortably into the into the puzzle that's known there's no incentive to uh, reshape the entire picture to bend it uh, to your own will and willingness yeah that's beautifully put you know i i just think of it as sort of as the shift point and uh, that we're at such at the beginning of it 
from survivalism as our orienting principle to authenticity. And through a survivalist lens, you just tried to fit into the system, and, and there were benefits, and there were detriments, but there were benefits to fitting into the system, and you defined who you are by what put food on the table, whatever mask or adaptation got you through the day, and that's what the self was. And this, some of us, like it or not, can't stop questing for to figure out what the authentic face looks like. And we can't figure out how to integrate that with the survivalist world. And so we're often left out on our own. And, you know, I think social media and shows like this are helping for us to bridge to each other to realize that whatever I was doing in my 20s in a courtroom with Eddie when I was going, I am not this man, I am not this man, that I wasn't the only one doing that. Yeah. But at the time, it really felt like I was. And even just the, for me, the conversation. So this is a conversation and, and my sense of myself as a conversationalist, the inviting of ideas, the inviting of perspectives. So, to, so everyone can grow. Um, that's what I find in our, uh, virtual community. Because that's what it is at this moment in time. You know, the outliers are organizing. You know, <laughs> look, right. look out, folks, because the outliers are now organizing in a way that is uh, substantive. You know, in the past, it was like, okay, someone would come along and a book would kind of emerge and we'd be like, wow, that's great. But now it's, it's so quick. You don't have to wait for the next great no- novel to be published. Not that your next great novel, uh, you specifically, Jeff, isn't going to have tremendous impact, but it's also just the day to day. Yeah. I wonder if, um, I understand absolutely what you're saying, but as you're saying it, it occurs to me mm. that even as it appears that the uh, outliers are organizing, uh, that a wave is breaking, mm. um, I wonder if it might, might be more accurate to say that uh, we are seeing our own shadow like, uh, like uh, Poxitani Phil, we're seeing our own shadow, and spring is coming. Um, but uh, we promise, Jeff. <laughs> we promise. But um, I, I, this word "outliers"—it's in the nature of an outlier to uh, continue to expand, to continue to push back the frontier of awareness. Yeah, that's what's speeding everything up. Yeah, exactly, and so Access there is to it's, outliers. It's organizing um, behind. We look back and we see uh, a new unifi- more unifying principles organizing behind us, but we're, uh, it's, we're sort of pulling this, uh, this shadow self, both dark shadow and light shadow, pulling it forward into something absolutely unknown. Uh, so uh, at the edge of it, it doesn't feel too organized. Hmm. I don't think it is organized. I don't think it can be organized. It's got a chaos element. You call it beautiful chaos, which yeah, I like, yeah. where we move into relationship with that which previously made us uncomfortable yeah. and, and then create out of that, which is clearly, Jeff, your gig. Um, or, or we, or, or you know, there, there's, the, there's a terrifying chaos and then there's this beautiful chaos and, and it's just our relationship with the chaos. Beautiful. Thoughts on that, Jeff? It, I just, it's chaotic magnificence, the nature of transformation. It's always like this. I know. Hey, Mag. You know, I think I think Maslow called it grumble theory, and I think of it culturally too. That you kind of reach a certain plateau of awareness, you sit there and integrate that, you enjoy the fruits of that experience for a while, and then you start to grumble for the next stage in your consciousness, and that means you move in the direction of something that feels chaotic. You know, frustration is the harbinger of change, and you know, I find that happens in the creative writing process all the time. I find it happens after, like, the book is done, and I start to nestle into that satisfaction, and then a couple of days later, I start to feel like I'm clamoring towards the chaos of the creative process again. Grumble. Do you know, I've never heard that. I yeah, never, grumble I've theory. never heard grumble theory, but it reminds me of Ben Cartwright Ponderosa theory. <laughs> I, love, no. I love the pun. I, I have episodes. That you have episodes? So do you know the, the Cartwright Ponderosa theory? <laughs> the Cartwright Ponderosa theory is uh. that Ben and the boys were out, uh, were out, and they had the Ponderosa, and there was this fabulous wretch, and then um, they would outgrow it. Every few years, they'd outgrow it. They'd get out there, and they'd chop all this timber, and they'd build new bunkhouses, and... Um, <laughs> 
And then um, a couple of years would go by and, you know, Haas would be off doing his thing and Adam would be doing his thing and the other one, Purnell was in Paris and <laughs> suddenly, you know, suddenly Ben Cartwright woke up one day and he said, We've, we, we need to grow. There's no room here. There's no room. And they'd all come back and cut down. That's the Ponderosa theory of growth. I love, I love this. That's fantastic. <laughs> we have to grow uh, right now. We have to uh, promote or perish. So we're going, to, we're going to step out for a second. Uh, we will oh, be back great. after these words with our guest, Jeff Brown. Welcome back to Cutting Edge Consciousness. Thought-provoking discussions and bold ideas from the edge of possibility. We're still here. You're still here. Jeff Brown's still here. So um, I guess we can keep talking. <laughs> We might as well keep going, right? Do I show of hands? Okay. <laughs> so I want to talk about my own edge in terms of um, intimacy and even ecstasy, where I feel myself topping out and sort of running back because the relationship conversation, which mm -hmm. we have not just once a year on New Year's, but we do do it on New Year's. Uh, with but we are the, the, we're the particularly wives. good with our relationships once a year. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. The, the um, Jeff, you like to call it the grist for the soul mill, right? This kind of uh, abrasive. The where grit. The, uh, or the grit, yeah. Uh, whichever way uh, you want to uh, spin it. But the idea that there's a, um, a wariness of getting too comfortable and a moving towards greater levels of intimacy, which has been a conversation with Jasmine that we've had. And so we recently bought a book on kissing, which is kind of corny, but I think just buying the book was, was enough to say we want to work on a kissing because uh, we skipped to other things when it's time to be intimate and there's intimacy and connection in the kissing and we feel like we've lost that so that's our that's my new well, how you doing it sounds with that? corny no it sounds great how are you doing with that well you know we're kissing more i like that i actually really like it it's so it's nice. would you be willing to share with our listeners a tip <laughs> just give, go, give us a tip from the book well you know here's the thing the, forget the book because i actually think the book is, is junk you didn't get one good tip from the book i haven't read that much of the book oh, that's <laughs> look good. i bought the book this to I, say i bought it because my wife said uh, we, we gotta do something about kissing so i bought it <laughs> Look, honey, there's a book. See, this is what we have to do, actually. We have to get my wife to read Jeff's book, because that'll incite all kinds yes, of new, yes, yeah. uh, cool. And, yeah, but then fun. you've moved off the kissing again. I don't know, Jeff. Well, and, and, well, it's a very triggering. It's 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 a hardcore. It's, I call it karmic boot camp. But but you, it may it may move you back in the direction of really uh, attenuated, attuned kissing, actually. Uh, yeah. Depending on where you land in the that's process. the that's the operative um, the operative word there, Jeff. It's about attunement. Yeah. Well, and it's and, and it's also about where we inhibit. Look, I ecstasy that that word. So we're not going to get we're not going to get the one the one single kissing tip. The we're soft, not going to get that. The soft lips. That's soft all. Soft lips. Soft lips. That's soft lips. the tip. Soft your Moist, lips. dry, yeah, just, wet. No, just no, just soft in that. There's a cushion in the lips, and if you just meet the cushion with the cushion, yeah. It, it well, we're in Beverly Hills here, so there's a lot of Botox push. around. <laughs> yeah, you can improve. You're not Botox. It's the injections. <laughs> the what injections. we call uh, miracle. When you meet the cushion with the cushion, soon you'll be pushing. Uh, yeah, there nice, you go. So nice. Chapter seven. The adolescent that's, mind is skipping to, skip fourth, seven. to third base already. Skip seven. You can skip second. Jeff, you're reading ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading. <laughs> but but my edge in all in all honesty with with intimacy and ecstasy, uh, that's you want to talk about playing at my edge. That's one that I'm not. I mean, I, you know, that's, it is much harder. It is much more challenging in my own experience to operate um, in flow, in joy, than it is to um, persist in the struggle. I'm, oh, I'm good, very yeah, well schooled. I am an expert in struggle. In struggle. Yeah. But in the joy, yep. there is an innocence there uh, that triggers some very, very old blueprinting, yeah. uh, some very, very old hurts and shames and wounds uh, that occurred at the, the last time uh, that I was innocent. And those things come up again. Yeah. And they have to be uh, recognized and acknowledged and responded to before we can tentatively resume that arrested development and move into the flow. Yeah, that's right. 
I mean, Lowen struggled with that in an uncommon bond, and I've struggled so much with that. It's when I reach that real edged point of ecstatic experience, the depth of vulnerability, the penetration of unity consciousness, the degree of openness was so difficult. I remember this moment in my real life where I had that opening in, in love, and it was it was so absolutely, it felt like the, my birthright. It felt like all of our birthrights. This mm. was the, the place we're here to inhabit, to reach the stage where we can live this as breath and food. And, and I remember feeling like, I can't sustain this. And, and, and it, was, it was partly because of my early life, as Barnett said, prior experiences or associations with that degree of openness. But it was also, I, I felt like the vibration, the survivalist vibration of the world, which is harsh and armored and edgy, just didn't support that level of subtle, subtle interface. Well, and this is, this is true. If, if, if we go for it, um, the world around us, uh, this is my experience. It, it's interesting. I'm going to go back to Susan for a minute because people love or really don't love. Susan, your friend whose name we will not mention? Yeah. Uh huh. But, but she goes for it in a way that, again, is, for me is unnerving, but I'm so excited by it and grateful for her and her, her willingness to do that. And yet, the self-conscious or the self-protective part of me will look around sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. in public or even in a training and go, whoa, is, is everybody with us? Mm-hmm. You know, and they're not. And, and that then because I'm I'm always waiting for something to be thrown at me, you know, then I start to pull back because safety is my organizing, you know, is this sort of self-organizing uh, orientation. A- and so it's always this kind of one step forward and maybe two steps back and then a step out and, you know. But but Jeff, you, you go for it. And, and these characters, the, the way that you've uh, written this book, uh, tell us more. Well, you know, Lowen, his name is Lowen Cooper. Half Jewish guy, Montreal background actually, Barnett. Um, really, what part of town? Yeah, uh, well, we didn't get that specific. <laughs> we'll work it out. By the time we meet him in the book, he's like, you what, know, he's what, living in Kensington Market in Toronto. Uh, when uh, when Barnett directs the film, though, we're going to write the whole back. Exactly, exactly. He's fantastic. Uh, smoke, but, meat, and rye. <laughs> but he, you know, he's he's a rep- sort of a, an armored male consciousness, and he has this profound opening. And we define the term an uncommon bond in the dictionary at the back. And and he, you know, he has no other choice. Like he, he says, you know, Goliath or go lie with. Hercules or Hercules, pick your path. And his warrior identification says, absolutely don't open to this. You'll never be much of a trial lawyer. You're going to enter a completely different energetic and emotional terrain. And, and yet the love is so strong, that and, and his body shuts down. He can't link his heart to his genitals because now he's actually vulnerable, and they come together, and he has to make a choice, and he does. The love pulls him so strongly towards the connection that he ultimately has to open and finds profound experience of unity consciousness through the love portal, far beyond anything he ever experienced on the meditation cushion as a lone wolf meditation warrior, any of those things. And, and then his heart is broken by her, and he spends many chapters trying to figure out, he can't go back to closed heart anymore, so he has to figure out how to live in that pain body experience with his heart open and, and try to love that experience forward rather than just going back to an armored consciousness. I love that you disguise uh, in character, in this character of Lowen, because I, I, I've said this many times, that in the playing of a character, I had more permission and I felt more real. Um, it's interesting, too, in science fiction often, the exploring of possibility. Well, it's just science fiction, so we're protecting ourselves from the ridicule right. of going that far. And then what happens, of course, is is the flip phone, which, Jeff, you still have one of those, I know. Proudly, <laughs> proudly do. Is, is first illustrated as a communicator in Star Trek. And, of course, it becomes uh, manifest. But we have to do it. Uh, maybe not have to, but maybe it's just easier to do it in the disguise of the character, in the disguise, and in, in the, under the auspices of, oh, it's science fiction, here's my permission uh, outlet. So I think it's fascinating, because obviously this reeks of, of your personal experience, Jeff. Yeah, absolutely. I had an uncommon bond experience, and I wrote my master's thesis about that experience. And I do, an, I have an author's note at the end of the book where I detail the context for the book. So the details of the story are different, the characters, the location so forth. But the, the heart of the experience for the male character was what I wrote about briefly in Soul Shaping, and it's a more expanded version of that. And, and then it moves and changes in different directions uh, towards the, the end of it. But yeah, I'm, I'm definitely writing from the place of 
having experienced what it's like to try to open this frozen heart. Well, and even going farther than my own experience, you know, the the ability in the character is to project farther than I would naturally go or have gone. Absolutely. And, you know, the beauty of that's fiction. It's a wonderful experience. You know, so, and I get to use, like, there's a character named Dude who is a movie type character. He's a homeless mystic, but he says he's not homeless. He calls himself houseless. He says that we're homeless because we're not at peace in our own skin. Oh, that's good. Yeah, and Dude... (laughs) Dude spews all kinds of wisdoms. Lowen goes to talk to him in Kensington, and, and the wisdoms that he's spewing are wisdoms from my quotes books. And only people who read my books would know that. But, you know, you can play with these mechanisms in fiction that you just can't in, in nonfiction. Movie director, Mr. Mr. Bain? Yeah. Um, one of the things that strikes me uh, very powerfully is that at long last, what was heretofore... Um, uh, largely conceptual and intellectualized. Emotionals were largely intellectualized. Yeah. Uh, growth has been largely intellectualized. And uh, it's been necessary to come to identify that uh, we have been living from the head. Our consciousness, seat of consciousness, has been, we've largely experienced it as a head trip. Uh, and that to uh, recognize that in ourselves and slowly begin to move it, uh, shuttle it down into the body so that we have a more holistic relationship with um, all that is. Um, That is now, only now, uh, becoming uh, reflected in our literature. I mean, there are the great classic works of literature that uh, have this astonishing... um, Consciousness that is um, a, a guide and 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 um, uh, an inspiration. The collected works of Shakespeare and Blake and and and, and so many others. But in our modern, uh, in the modern canon, the modern, you know, walk into uh, a bookstore if you can find one, um, and we had shell, you know, thirty feet of shelf space um, about the seven steps of this and the third, the ten steps of this, and very little literature that was not. Uh, tutorial. I mean, I, I've been guilty of making tutorial films uh, that, you know, only because we didn't have a real sense of how to pull those stories into a lived in state. So they were just, they were all like soapbox things. So this book um, right. uh, is uh, so encouraging. It reveals, uh, you know, it's a litmus test of the zeitgeist. Um, Thank you, it, Barnett. It absolutely reveals a, a certain embodiment of. We, we've moved. We've become who who we have been scratching for. Well, that's a, you know. Thank you. One of the struggles in the book was how do I weave insights and wisdoms from the kind of writing that I often do into a story, and and partly at a pace that's believable for the reader, so that Lowen doesn't seem wiser than he could be as a story, as a character. So that's an issue. But additionally, how do how do we how does he become the inquirer? Uh, in the journey in the way that I was, because it's true, I started with Soul Shaping, which was nonfiction. I was comfortable writing nonfiction, but how do you take it into a fictional context and make the story of our life a story that includes this kind of an inquiry, which is what's true for so many people, but yet we had it all bifurcated. It was completely separated out, and and I think it is time for us to begin to take this, the self-help spiritual inquiry, to, for want of a better term, and to bring it into subjectivity. And it's, it, that's where we live with it. Yeah, and it's such a better bargain than the sort of adolescent fantasy or the, I don't know, the Fifty Shades fantasy that let, let's move into something that's more, more soulful and more um, raw and more, I'm going to use the word real, more real, you know? There's a level of complexity uh, to that's these it. kinds of stories that was um, inaccessible Maybe it was there, and I didn't calibrate, and I wasn't aware of it. Um, but now that I am more aware of it, I am also um, able to recognize it in, in literature. Uh, that it seemed to me 
was that literature simply didn't exist before. Yeah. Well, you know, even when I started to work on this book, I looked around everywhere in self-help, spiritual, or anything like it, and nobody had done it. And I just, I, I makes no sense to me how no one had done it. And I think it so is maybe Cervantes may have had. Uh, he may have had a. I'm going to look for Cervantes, but in, in terms of our modern era of writers in the field, yeah. no, no one seemed to have done it. And and yeah. I guess it was because the zeitgeist just wasn't oriented in that direction yet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know what? One of the things that strikes me um, is, and, and this is language that I've used in the past, so forgive me, but what wants to be expressed through Speak me. Speak Chinese. <laughs> that would be a feat. That would be something fresh. <laughs> yeah. No, but just, just what wants to be expressed through me, and, and then the seeking out mechanisms, right? That I understand the quality. Maybe I don't understand it. Maybe I just can feel it. But then, and then, and then, wanting to release it into. So, what's the forum? You know, I, I, I for years I acted. I don't anymore. But now I'm getting up and doing storytelling and and doing a bit more uh, public speaking. You know, okay, that's the outlet. You know, and and so I love this idea of, you know, just in the character, in the how do I create the characters so this doesn't feel soapboxy? How do I create situations where the learning can be more organic? And then how do I push my own sort of proverbial envelope? So that I'm in the learning and the process of writing and exploring and 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 releasing this into the world, and then I'm very curious, Jeff, to see what comes back as feedback. On, on Bond, oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, there's been a fair amount of feedback, but you know, it hasn't been read by the public at large yet. So, you know, just the people that I pay to say good things to me. Um, so, <laughs> is I, the check in the mail, by the way? <laughs> <That's what laughs> we got to get our pay day here. Check I have mail, a buddy. Do- I, it's I actually a st- PayPal <laughs> transfer. <laughs> That's right. right, right, right. We'll get you a buck and a half. <laughs> hey, um, let's let's tell folks before we let you go where they can uh, get this because it, it hasn't been released yet. So, what's our date? What's the what's the well? Op- it's official date is May one, but I. I picked them up last week. So everything off in realment.com is being signed and sent now. Um, and at Amazon, the uh, books have been shipped to Georgia to my distributor, New Leaf. And so they probably will be moving off of Amazon in about a week. So amazon.com and any bookstore can access it through Ingram uh, or through Baker and Taylor as well. And uh, for those of you who can't remember that, you can always go to the Cutting Edge Consciousness website, and we will have Call Freeman. Uh, links for that. Yeah, give out my cell phone number. Well, that's what we'll do for that. Uh, hey, Freeman's number will be up yeah. on the website, along with uh, all information that you would need to find uh, Jeff's book. You can also find it on Amazon now. Uh, you can um, pre-order it. And, uh, uh, and you should it. pre-order it. You should pre-order it, unless you're listening to this not as a broadcast, but as a podcast, in, in which, which case, case it's already late there. To the party. So um, if you order it now in two days, it can be in your mailbox, an uncommon bond, a novel, an uncommon work of literature from an uncommon friend. Thank you, Barnett. I'm going to send you a copy. <laughs> Jeff, signed. I love you, brother. Check, it's all, it's always a joy, you know. And 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 uh, off air, we'll figure out when you're uh, coming to uh, stay in my guest bedroom uh, soon. I know that's. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Hey, uh, always a pleasure. Uh, have a wonderful day, and we are so grateful you took some time. Go to shovel hang, snow. Hang out with us. Go shovel snow. And, and Thanks, for, guys. And for those of you listening, we invite you to hang out through the commercial because we'll be back after these messages to wrap things up here on. Cutting Edge Consciousness. Welcome back to Cutting Edge Consciousness. Thought-provoking discussions and bold ideas from the edge of possibility. And welcome back to Cutting Edge Consciousness. Freeman Michaels here with Barnett Bain. We're going to be thought-provoking, not just provoking. I hope so. Thought provoking. Well, you know, a I little, challenge you. A little provoking. <laughs> <Say> something provocative. <laughs> oh, I snorted. That's not good. Um, you did. You snorted. It doesn't happen very often, but every once in a while, I, I get, think this. No, this is probably your first snort in about four years. No, I snort every once in a while. I get lazy in my laughing, and and I forget to tuck it in. And it gets a little sloppy, um, which you know is not a bad. Uh, you don't bray though. We have a oh, friend. We have a mutual worst. friend that brays. Yeah. Oh, you know what my favorite laugh is? Yakov's when he does speaking his little. Brain. That That's is what I'm so thinking of. funny. Huh. Yeah, that, he haws like he a horse. Haws. It's wild. Is that who you're talking about? Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I saw him the other night, and uh, 
there is a very funny bit. Uh, this woman comedian opened, and she this is you know, Yakov Smirnov. You're talking Yakov about Smirnov for, was the headliner, but yeah. I'm saying that the woman earlier in the set, yeah, yeah. yeah the yeah. first woman up, yeah, in her maybe mid to late forties, and she was saying that she's been single her whole adult life, and she said, uh, in my twenties, uh, people said, good for you. In my 30s, people said, you're strong. In my 40s, they said, you're spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> you must be spiritual, That's right? Great. Yeah. That's really great. Yeah, that was fun. What was crazy about that, <clears throat> that um, set, th that woman was great, and there was a, a few other people that were great, but there was so much adolescent sort of... Was this at the comedy store? Yeah, it was a comedy store. Um, it was rough. Like... You know, I was laughing, but you know, it's not that it's not that profound. I mean, Yakov is beautiful, um, though. I have, have to be honest; I feel like he needs to get out of there because it's still juvenile humor. It's still, you know, um, I don't. Even, I can't say it on radio. Uh, jokes, those jokes, you know, and a lot of you know, I don't know, trending back to stereotypes as if they're real, you know, and they are to the degree you so buy. So he into may them. be a. Um he, you know, all these comedy clubs, uh, just like everything else, they, uh, there is the soup of mediocrity. Yeah. But I remember when I used to go and uh, see uh, my uh, friend Robin Williams, mm. uh, it, there was the soup of mediocrity, and then unannounced he would walk on, and um, you would be raised. Totally. You would be, uh, it, it's an induction state, you'd be lifted to such a... Such a sense of um, well-being, such a spirit of giving, uh, such a um, such a gracious um, state. Yeah. Uh, that we're, were it not for the you know where if you don't work out, if you're a fisherman, you need to bring your wares to the fish market. Um, yeah. If you don't work out in such a place, where else are you going to work out? And even now, you know, there are people like Louis C.K. and, you know, they go to the clubs. Yeah. And um, Seinfeld used to go to the clubs, still goes to the clubs. And it raises everyone's game. And if it doesn't raise their game, for the audience, we get to see uh, what a player is. And mm. we, get to, we get to reflect on that and feel, the, make the distinction and know, well, where can my own, where in my own life, whether it's conscious or not, it does imprint, where in my own life am I mediocre or can I show up firing on more cylinders? So yeah, where, it, it where, may be where, a perfect place for Yaakov. Yeah, where am I running the same old tune? And where am I giving in to the pressure, right? Because it was mm -hmm. sort of like there was a string of three guys, one after another, who did the same sort of homophobic, you know, talking about penis size, uh, silliness, mm -hmm. and one after another. And I just thought, really? Is that, that's it? That's, that's what you guys got? And it was like they were playing off each other. And they thought they the got guy, a lot of laughs, though. They did, you know. Because and, it's all developmental. I mean, you meet people where they are, and then yeah. somebody comes in and, um, and raises all the boats. I'm just surprised that it's at that level. Like, I mean, this goes back... When I first started in San Francisco, the other cafe I used to go see at yeah. Cole and Carl. This yeah. is in the 80s. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it feels like it was better then, actually. You well, know? you were younger, so you were adolescent. And Good point. It, you were, you know, it's like saying... You know, my fifth grade geography just seemed to be much more interesting <laughs> when I was in the fifth grade. Right, and right, even right. in the sixth and seventh grade, I could relate to it more. Yeah. No, this is the idea when I was writing my book is that the, the uh, publishing company was saying, you know, it needs to be at a fifth grade level. That was my, that was what I got in terms of feedback. Now, I probably had the wrong publisher, to be very honest. I had feedback today from uh, my publisher. Yeah. Uh, about um, some video material that I'm shooting in New York next week. Hmm. And um, some voices said, well, this uh, should be much simpler. They actually said, uh, you should, I'm not going to, because okay, I know you're all listening and I love you. <laughs> so um, they mis made some suggestions that I thought were not uh, reflective of who I am. They don't authentically reflect me to to um, pour myself into a pattern uh, that works for somebody else. It's not an authentic voice. And yeah. uh, to simplify who I am, I'm not simple. Uh, I, I, I'm not simple. Yeah. So to simplify what I have to say 
so that it can be understood by um, someone who has who doesn't understand what I'm saying. We've I, talked not about, every message is designed for right. every listener. That's right. We've talked about that with his show. You know, there was uh, early on in the show a lot of pressure. There was that. a lot of pressure to you know sort of. Um, ask more questions that were pre-scripted and pre-script more of the show and we're saying no it's, it, we want to we want to do jazz and even if we're not very good at jazz we'll get better by you know doing this because that's because because the glimpse of the the quality of conversation that we want to be in was enough to fuel us through all the frustrations of the learning curve right yeah but once upon a time we uh, there was a time, not necessarily on this show. By the time we'd started, it, we'd already moved past it. But there was a time when that was the kind of thinking and the sort of approach to life that made sense to me. That made yeah. sense to you. It doesn't make sense to me now, and I, I I'm not interested in having a conversation at that level of complexity. I am interested in having a conversation where I am. Yeah. Uh, and my, you know, I'm not trying to be more than I am, but I'm also not trying to be less than I am. Totally, yeah. And the and the hints, the glimpses along the way, <clears throat> of what the potential or possibility is, even if we're not realizing it in the moment. Look, the first time I got up to tell a story, it wasn't that good, but there was enough in it. You know, and there was enough drive and desire to keep going that kept me writing them. All right, it was my 12th story that was pretty good, you know, but that's what it took, you know, that's and I, I, there was enough of a glimpse and I stuck with it long enough just off that glimpse to where I got better at it. So you take that story and I've seen uh, some of your stories and they are wonderful. <laughs> They're wonderful. Um, but you. you take the stories and you take them to the venues. Yeah. And uh, yeah. um, largely the, um, the level of the stories, like anything else, um, there is excellence and mastery. And then there are the various levels that, um, that uh, approach mastery or don't. And then there are, there are superseding levels of genius. Uh, but mostly, uh, you, you know, mostly things are of a different order. So th threading back to... Um, Yaakov. Where else is he going to do comedy? You go to you go there, and he walks in, and and yes, there is a, there is life after uh, penis jokes. There yeah. is life. Doesn't make them bad, but put the two together, there will be an audience um, for the penis jokes, and um, but many of them will be at a place where they're ready to peel off and lift to something else. So. It's big work that he's doing. Yeah. That, to layer in one other thing that comes to mind, too, the some of the accomplished speakers, because I've now gotten into this circuit of going out and seeing people who speak. Uh, well, I've been around it for a little bit, last 10 years, maybe. Um, and there are people who uh, have done it so many times and they've got it so down that it's become brittle. It's Pat. Yeah. And so this, uh, going way back to our conversation with Jeff, the idea that the discomfort is got to be in the mix because that's what has the vitality. We talk about it as the edge, you know, that we've got to play a little more on an edge. If it becomes a little too comfortable, a little too stale. Then you know the territory. Hmm. Then you're just calling it in. It becomes jargon. Comes jargon. That's like a curse word. Comes jargon around here. Ooh. Ooh. Don't we have garlic when we pull out. <laughs> That's right. We have and, garlic and, and silver. Yeah, the spikes. Spikes. Yeah. Yeah. Put it to rest, would you? Ooh. Ooh. It's like talking points, you know, when you have Ooh. a guest on. Ooh. And they do their talking points, and it's the same as the last 12 interviews they've done. You go, God, really? Is that all we're doing? Is this call and response? Or is there something about traveling off the map or ma making a map, making, as you like to say? A map. Yeah, making, making a map, map in front of us, you know, not not looking back. I love Jim Selman's line that if uh, if you could prove a possibility, it would be an example. I love that because the idea is, you know, looking for examples for something you want to create. It's okay, we do it. Like I, I, Jeff was saying, he looked out to see if there are other books. It doesn't matter whether there's ever books or not. I mean, but it's okay, we do that, right? We do look for examples, but then the launch into the unknown is where the juice is. So, you know, it's fine. We prep. We get up to the edge. We look at it. We go, okay. You know, we look up some YouTube videos of the people that did it. You know, maybe we can find some inspiration to know that it's possible, and then we'll go. But uh, it's always a leap. The, um, there's an archetype. There's an energetic 
uh, expression that comes from beyond what is known that shows up in our world as these archetypes. Mm. Uh, just, we're familiar with some of them, like the magician or the lovers, and um, yeah, the warrior, the warrior, king. the king. Yeah, but there are many archetypes. Right, um, and one of them is the fool. Hmm. Uh, at one octave of the fool, it is the archetype is expressed as this um, clown who knows nothing. Right, the idiot, the simpleton. Yeah. Um, the circle ends where it begins, but not quite because it, it actually kicks up an octave. So it's more, it kicks up to a spiral. At the other octave, by the time you come around, we grow and grow in patterns and seasons. You come right around, uh, and the same archetype that was once expressed in us and uh, elsewhere as a fool, as a, as a simpleton, is now a wise fool that knows an awful lot, an awful lot about the way of the world and is also innocent and consciously a fool because knows that really has no clue about the bigger picture. This is, I mean, Shakespeare captured this so beautifully. You know, he would have these full characters, of course, the touchstone of, of As You Like It, and but all kinds of them. And there would be this dialogue of, are you, a, are you a knave? Are you a fool? Or are you, you know, are you a genius? You know, and it would be this edge of, of, of you know, we don't know. Because in one moment, it sounds like utter gibberish. And the next moment, it's cutting wisdom that's, you know, cutting through the social construct. You know, yeah. But then you have this other, you have the shadow side of these archetypes. There's like the thing like the trickster. Yeah. Which is um, not a fool. It is a, not a wise fool. It is a. A fool pretending to be expert. Mm. And it is very oh, easy for the <laughs> undiscerning to be seduced <laughs> yeah, in yeah, yeah. T- at the, uh, by the silver tongues of experts. Yeah, yeah. That's funny. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a sticky one in our world. Because... And many times the trickster doesn't know that they're tricksters. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. The, the, swallow the, their own uh, Kool Aid. What one of the, uh, the real wisdom is when you know that you don't know. Yeah, and there's a graciousness and a generosity in that. When I uh, hear the overpromising of people in our industry, it's when I know we're in that territory. When people, you know, guarantee and that I, you know I can clear you of lifelong you know hurts and wounds in thirty seconds by doing a yes. healing on you. Yeah. Um, I, of course, very quickly get very suspicious and I'm like, oh, great. So there's this um, uh, lack of integrity, right? Because the integration, at least from my perspective, of whatever aspects we have been, whatever hurts come, uh, have come in our life, they, they're not for no reason. We're not trying to fix or get rid of or solve them. And so it's a very sort of immature mind that wants to be fixed. I, I, I've had it myself. I can slip into it in any given moment. You know, this, you know, someone's going to save me. I used to with women all the time. I would date with the, this kind of, you know, very naive sense that if I met the right woman, I'd be saved. Or my, it's even more subtle than that. Or my, um, my savings account, my investments. Mm. Um, these are things that are going to hedge me against life hmm. and we swallow that kool-aid yeah well and in the marketing device of being sold on it all the time yes you know it's yes. constantly My vitamins and there is a balance between what is uh what are sustaining energies but the balance uh tips unfortunately when the when it moves from sustaining energies to these are defenses yeah strategies yeah. to control but that trickster piece where someone's a charlatan, not even because they, 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 they're not meaning to be. No. It's not malicious. They bought their own cooler. They bought their own cooler, and they really think they can cure you with the, with the warmth of their hand. And the truth is, no one needs to be cured. So knock it off. Like, you can support people in their own growth and healing. Great. But to the idea that you're the answer, you know, whoopsie daisy. That's where the guru comes from. All right. Uh, enough said. <laughs> well, it has to be enough said because we ran out of time. <laughs> So, so it seems to me that uh, upset or not, Spence is pulling the plug. For those of you who have enjoyed the show, we invite <laughs> you to keep coming back to Cutting Edge Consciousness. Thanks for listening. I know.